Games as a service. If you've been involved with computer or video games for any length of time, you've probably come across that phrase. I don't know what the origin is. Wikipedia is no help. Look at this first sentence under history. The idea of games as a service began around 2004 with the introduction of blah blah blah. That doesn't matter. That's already wrong. I mean, EverQuest was the first major game I knew about doing this in 99. But even before that, I remember hearing about the Sierra Network from 91. I really doubt that was even when this started either. It was probably some mud. Yeah, before World of Warcraft, there were muds. Fun for everyone. 2004, you're no help at all here, Wikipedia. And I got sidetracked in the first minute. Nice. Anyway, what I was getting at is I don't know the origin of this phrase, but it's so thoroughly entered the vernacular that I'm honestly wondering if it's the result of some subtle propaganda campaign. I say that because it's such a harmless sounding phrase, but it hides a terrible, if not illegal, business practice. And that brings me to the title. Games as a service is fraud. Now that sounds clickbaity, and I guess it is, but I'm not exaggerating. I mean it. Unfortunately, it's not the kind of fraud I can easily explain in one sentence. So it's not like changing the odometer on a car, then covering it up and selling it as though you never did that. That's easy fraud. Anyone understands that. This is a more sophisticated kind. Like how even now a lot of people are still confused on how Goldman Sachs broke the law leading up to the 2008 financial crash and how a lot of people should have gone to prison. This is more like that. Now I'll warn you, this video is going to be long and could get boring in spots, but it's necessary. See, this video is my declaration of war on games as a service. I'm going up against years of push narrative here. This isn't going to be easy. I have to explain everything as a way to provide ammo to the troops. And even though it's going to be long, I'm going to say a lot. You know how some court cases drag on weeks or months? Well, this is me putting my entire case in this video. So however long it is, it's me saying it all. I'm going to explain what games as a service is, why it's fraud, address any counter arguments, and most importantly, what can be done about it. I have a plan, sort of. Oh, and I think it's games as a service is fraud and not are fraud because it's referring to the singular practice games as a service. But I guess you could also literally have games as a service are something. I really don't know if, so let's jump right in. What is games as a service? Well, Wikipedia defines it as a ha ha, gotcha. No, we're not doing that. They had their chance. I was hoping they would make this easy on me. Nope. Gama Sutra defines it as uh, this long-winded philosophical ideal. Okay, yeah, it looks like I'm gonna have to do this myself. Okay, first, let's get something out of the way. Because this isn't confusing enough, games as a service is not the same as a game service. A game service is usually a rental system. So if you pay a company 20 bucks a month and can rent games or have them stream to you, but you can also buy them outright somewhere, then that's not what I'm talking about. That's not fraud, that's fine. But games as a service, how do we define that? Well, it's a business practice, but what? Well, if you're a gamer, you probably have an idea of what it is. So let's list some common traits and see if we can narrow it down to what actually defines it. Here's my list, let's go down the line. Online only. Yes, I'd say that one defines every use of games as a service. Now some games have downloadable content that you can run offline, but that's not what the industry means when they refer to this. In fact, another term for games as a service is live service games. In other words, you're connected online, so it's live. But hey, I'll give another freebie. If offline games as a service games exist, then those are not fraud. So hey, Oblivion Horse Armor. Not fraud. This is actually a great baseline if you want to determine how fair or not you think I'm being towards game companies. This says something about where my standards are these days. But back to defining things, we'll say yes, every games as a service is online only. However, not every online game is games as a service. We'll come back to that in a minute. Extra online features. This is stuff like stat tracking, matchmaking, player messaging, and so on. Well, games as a service usually have these, but they're by no means a guarantee. Plus, regular games can have these too. 
player messaging and voice chat go way back. Stat tracking certainly happened in offline games. Matchmaking was usually third-party software in the past, so I think it's safe to say none of those define games as a service. Microtransactions. And you may not believe this, but no, those are not what define games as a service. Here are a few games as a service that had no microtransactions whatsoever. However, I will say the overwhelming majority of games as a service do have microtransactions, and this is the number one reason companies really like this practice. However, since exceptions do exist, this is not actually what defines it. Subscription fees. Very few games still have these, so no. However, we have that trick again. Most games as a service do not have a subscription fee, but all games with a subscription fee are games as a service. Get it? Frequent updates. Well, a lot of good games as a service have these, but again, it's by no means what defines them. Plenty of games as a service go by years with no updates at all. So, nope, that's not it either. And massive multiplayer games. Nope, still not it. On one hand, you have some games as a service that are intended for a small number of players. On the other hand, you've had some gigantic games that are not this practice. The multiplayer mod for Just Cause 2 has had over 1,800 simultaneous players in the game, yet it is not considered games as a service. MMO games are usually games as a service, but not what defines it. Okay, so wow. The only definition that survived is games as a service are online only. And even that one has a caveat. See, some games are just meant to be played online. If you play the game Star Siege Tribes, the only way to really play it is to connect to other people. In essence, it's an online-only game. Yet it is not games as a service. You know why? Because you're still the one in control. Games as a service means the company is providing you the service of allowing you to play your game. And yes, I am being facetious. You didn't used to need permission for that. Now, people will debate what games as a service should mean, but this is the real world hard definition. Games as a service means the business practice of players not having control of whether they can play a game due to a company withholding that function. That is all it is in its purest, most distilled form. Oh sure, they usually have other stuff on this list, but none of those other traits could survive the definition test. In fact, I'd say this definition isn't even the intent of games as a service, but it is what defines it. If it doesn't have this, it is not games as a service. Okay, fraud time. So now we have a concrete definition of games as a service. But why is it fraud? Well, the simplest answer is it's being sold as something it's not. I'll break it down. But first, we have to understand the difference between a good and a service. Products are defined as services or goods. A good is something you buy and own. A service is an action performed for you. So if you buy a hammer, it's a good. It's a thing. It's yours. But if you get a haircut, that's a service. They didn't just hand you your haircut in a box. They used scissors to deliver the desired result or so I'm told. And again, I have to rail on Wikipedia here. Since they define goods as something tangible, then later say they're not always tangible. Good job contradicting yourself in the first sentence, guys. Whatever, that second part is correct. So things like digital movies you buy are intangible goods. You can't touch a movie, but it's still sold like a physical good. Well, guess what? Most games are goods too. Even games as a service. So yes, I just said games as a service are not services. I'll get to that. But I have to concede on one point. If it's a game that has a subscription fee that you pay each month, like World of Warcraft, under most laws, those are services, and I don't think I can make the case those are fraud. Those win this round. But you know what? We can work with that. Since that's what, five games now? Yeah, maybe 10. But let's try to establish legally that games as a service are not services. 
Now, of course, the law is different in every country, but we'll cover some major ones. Now, I can't take credit for most of this part. I found bits and crumbs of this on my own, but then I stumbled into a mother load of information on why games are goods and you own them. A highly researched user, Delisiu, created the best layman's explanation on this topic I've seen in the Linus Tech Tips forum. Oh, hi Linus. Now I admit, this is a colorful title, but putting that aside, he has some good logic. So let's look at the abridged version. A license is a right to use a property or intellectual property that belongs to somebody else. When you read, this software is licensed, not sold, in a software end user license agreement, this software refers to the software intellectual property and not the copy of that intellectual property that you've purchased via a software license. The software intellectual property is licensed, not sold. The license is sold, not licensed or leased. A little confusing there, but let's keep going. All the mass-produced items you've bought follow the same rules. You are purchasing a one-off copy of the intellectual property of those things, and there is a transfer of ownership over those instances, and you become the sole owner of that instance of intellectual property. You own it and have full property rights over it. Okay, just so everybody's with me, he's saying if you buy a copy of Half-Life, you don't own the rights to the Half-Life franchise. You can't sell additional copies of it but you do own your copy of Half-Life. A lot of goods are like this. If you buy a car, you don't own the manufacturing and design rights to that car model, but you do own your car. It's a basic concept. I said before, I'm going up against a narrative. Well, one myth you hear sometimes is you don't own any of your software. What he's doing here is explaining why that's almost always false. Turns out you have ownership rights after all. Who knew? Next, he says there are two types of software licenses, perpetual and subscription licenses. Perpetual ones last forever. So that copy of Mega Man that your brother has in the attic, that's a perpetual license. And this is why World of Warcraft gets a free pass for now. They want 15 bucks a month. That's as clear as day a subscription license. If you're not paying a subscription fee for your game, then it's being bought under a perpetual license. That's a really key point. A whole lot of things are gonna come back to this. A perpetual license is a product, and whenever it's sold, it undergoes transfer of ownership upon the point of sale. Ownership is what establishes one's decision-making authority over the thing. To sell something is to relinquish it as one's property and to relinquish all of one's decision-making authority over that thing to the person who bought it. Then the seller no longer has any rightful say over anything regarding that instance of software represented by its perpetual license. So there it is. If you only have to pay once and it's not a subscription fee for your game, then by definition, it's being sold under a perpetual license. Under most countries' laws, that means it's a good and not a service. This is why I wonder if games as a service is a deliberate propaganda term. It means the exact opposite of what it says. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, this is just some guy on the internet saying words. That doesn't prove anything. Fair point. But you know what helps a legal argument? If you back up what you're saying with legal documents that say the same thing? And that's exactly what he does for multiple countries. The European Union's highest court, the Court of Justice, has ruled that software sold via a perpetual license represents a good rather than a service, and the purchaser becomes the exclusive owner of that instance, just like a physical good. Then he links to the court documents for Usoft versus Oracle and a more professional explanation of what that means. Next up, Canada. He gives an outdated link, but I found this court case, which apparently rules software as a service is a good as explained in this article. They even refer to software as a service. I love it when it's black and white like that. And later he revises things saying Canada follows the World Intellectual Property Organization's International Classification of Goods and Services Guidelines. Yeah, you know we're having fun now with a name like that. Anyway, they say they're goods too. Next, Australia. You may have heard of this one. In the case of the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission versus Valve Corporation, Australia rules that, sure enough, games are goods. You have to love this quote in the conclusion. 
Each of Valve's challenges to the applicability of the Australian consumer law fails. Yada yada, Valve supplied goods, which are defined as including computer software. And then we get to the United States. Listen, the United States is hard mode when it comes to this topic. In the lower courts, nobody agrees on anything. In 2008, in the court case Werner v. Autodesk, a federal judge in Washington state said that yes, you own the software. Then in 2010, that was appealed to the Ninth Circuit, which said no, you don't own the software and you have to follow the end user license agreement rules. But then there was an amicus brief filed with it which said, yeah, this could easily be abused, could harm preservation, this is potentially a dangerous precedent, and hey Congress, why don't you do something about this? But even then, that decision was just for the Ninth Circuit states, not the entire US. Before I keep going, look at this, that giant headline saying you don't own anything. That's misleading. This is what I mean when I talk about a narrative. Especially because in 2013, the Supreme Court ruled on a different case, saying people in the US can resell copyrighted goods, which includes software licenses, and the first sale doctrine applies, which states that a seller retains no decision-making authority over a good once they have sold it to someone else. And as a side note, the official link to this court document was down. I had to find it using the Wayback Machine, so I guess that doesn't bode too well for the Supreme Court, but whatever. In the US, games as services being goods aren't quite proven, but there's a lot of precedent that implies they are. Delisiu says it best, a specific matter of software ownership has never gone to the USA Supreme Court, and it's likely that software publishers will prefer that it doesn't. He's damn right they do. Because in all likeliness, the verdict will be the same as it was in the European Union and in Australia. Because this matter has never gone to the USA Supreme Court, and because regional court verdicts have conflicted with each other in their conclusions, it is baseless for anyone to claim that people in the USA don't own their purchased software. So again, if there's no subscription fee, you own your games. Well, so what? Just because games as a service isn't actually a service, that doesn't mean anything. It's just a name for a business practice. Where does the fraud come in? Well, the fraud comes from that whole ownership thing. Remember, a seller retains no decision-making authority over a product once they have sold it to someone else. Now, some of you may know that I'm a huge advocate against killing games. By killing games, I mean the practice of a company's actions leaving a game completely unplayable by anyone who bought it. This is also known as bricking a game. Well, killing games and games as a service are handcuffed together. You almost don't have one without the other. See, all games as a service depend on you connecting to a server controlled by a company. That's fine while the game is running, but eventually most companies decide they're not making enough money on the game anymore to justify the server running. So they shut it down. Once that happens, every single person who bought the game can never play it again. If I sold you a copy of a game on disc, the next month while you were sleeping, I snuck into your house and broke the disc, I would go to jail. In practical terms, that's almost exactly what games as a service is. Companies engaged in this practice almost always destroy your product after they've sold it to you. And I keep saying this almost always happens. There's a reason for that. Some volunteers and I have put together a list of every game we could find that has been shut down and how that was handled. Now, if anything, this is the small list, since I filtered out games like you see here just to bring focus on the bigger problem cases. We came up with 122 titles that mostly meet that criteria. Now, this list may not be 100% accurate. It can be difficult to verify some information, but I'm guessing it's at least 95% accurate and it's probably the most extensive data collected on this topic to date. So, out of 122 titles, how many times did the companies do something to either A, give customers a chance to run their game after shutdown, or B, give a full refund, no strings attached? Well, from my best count, here it is. Yeah, that's five titles. Or in other words, about 4% of all games as a service. So hey, I made a clickbaity title, I'll fess up. If we're being completely honest, games as a service is not fraud. It's only fraud about 96% of the time. So if anyone says I'm exaggerating how bad all this is, it's true, I'm exaggerating 4%.
And who knows, we could have missed one. I'm making all this public, you're welcome to double check the data. In fact, I'm not sure which of those games were on a subscription license at the time of shutdown, so you might even be able to get that number down to 95, hey, maybe 94%. Oh, and some of these titles you can actually still run, usually due to illicit server emulators, but those are cases where the companies did nothing to help, and it was in spite of the company's actions, not because of them. More on that in a bit. So I'm calling this fraud because of the reality and the intent. Just because your game doesn't run doesn't make it fraud. There could be bugs, the hardware could go bad. I'm not talking about quirks, accidents, forces of nature. But with Games as a Service, the product is designed to fail as soon as they shut down the server. The fraud begins once they purposefully take away access to your product. Games as a Service is fraud because it involves selling perpetual licenses that are, in practice, not perpetual. The decision-making authority over the product is being removed from the buyer. Customers buy games with the expectation that they will function. If 100% of all copies sold of a game cease to function because of deliberate interference from the seller after the point of sale, how can that be considered an honest practice? Now the opposition would say this isn't fraud because you were sold a perpetual license. And just because the company breaks your game, it doesn't mean you lost your license. You are still free to repair the game after they break it. I say this is a disingenuous argument on multiple levels. If somebody sells you a bike and then later you get a flat tire, yes, your product no longer works and it takes some effort to repair it. But that's something the average person can be reasonably expected to do. Or hey, take it to a repair shop. More importantly, the company that sold you the bike didn't come to your house and puncture the tire. I see that as an important distinction. Now when a game as a service stops working, which again, I want to emphasize is a deliberate act, no one on earth could be reasonably expected to fix that. The reason for that is twofold. First, it takes specialized programming knowledge in order to recreate the portions of the server that were lost. Again, the way these games work is most of the data is on the customer's computer, but the company hosting the game has key information about how to run it where things spawn, logic routines, and so on. If you want, you can almost think of this as the body and this is the brain. When they shut the brain down here, a large portion of the game is now missing and it's unplayable. In order to run the game again, the person would have to write a new brain. I mean, server. Now that is an exorbitant amount of work and takes a lot of specialized knowledge. I would estimate only 5% of the population is even capable of doing that. However, it is possible. Whether that's a reasonable expectation of buyers to repair their product is debatable. I think it isn't, but that is nothing compared to the next part. Programming a new server is difficult enough, but companies will also encrypt their data in order to protect against hackers and piracy. This is known as Digital Rights Management, or DRM. Well, that's reasonable while the product is still being sold, but once it's shut down, then this is the equivalent of locking things up and throwing away the key. I've talked to a developer for a resurrected game server emulator, and he said they had a cryptography expert helping them decrypt the code, and even then, it took them years. So if you are qualified to crack codes like what the Nazis were using and win World War II in Europe, then yes, you might be qualified to repair your game. I'm really not exaggerating. Not only is that such a small percentage of the population capable of doing that, but even for them, that in no way can be considered reasonable. For most people, I'm talking 99.9% .9 or more, it is impossible for them to repair their game after shutdown. So not literally impossible, but again, I'm rounding. But let's try to shore this up a little legally. And again, the United States is hard mode. Some of you may have heard of the term planned obsolescence. That's the practice of designing goods to intentionally break faster in hopes that you'll buy a new one so they can make more money. Best I can tell, this is perfectly legal in the United States, unfortunately. But there's a subset of that called programmed obsolescence. See, unlike planned obsolescence, which just increases the odds the product will break over time, 
programmed obsolescence ensures it will break, on purpose, usually at a specific time. And it's not clear if that is legal in the US or not. There have been some cases on it, like class action lawsuit Jackie Blennis versus HP in 2008. Charges were pressed against Hewlett Packard for designing ink cartridges to shut down prematurely. HP denied any wrongdoing and yet awarded the complainants $5 million of credit to shut them up. Yeah, I'm sure they did that just to be nice. Otherwise, why wouldn't they fight it and maintain their innocence? Especially since they got hit with another class action lawsuit, San Miguel versus HP in 2016, for updating firmware on printers to stop accepting third-party cartridges. In other words, breaking functionality. This time, they were guilty of wrongdoing and had to pay out $1.5 million. Now, these both imply that programmed obsolescence could be illegal if challenged. However, in both cases, the reasoning behind the charges doesn't tie directly to that. So these aren't the strongest legal precedents, in my opinion. The strongest legal argument I did find was in 2017 in Impression versus Lexmark. The Supreme Court ruled that you have ownership of your product and are free to do with it as you please, even if patents still apply to it that control its behavior. While that's still a bit of a stretch to say programmed obsolescence isn't legal, I thought these lines from the ruling were noteworthy. Even if the restrictions in Lexmark's contracts with its customers were clear and enforceable under contract law, they do not entitle Lexmark to retain patent rights in an item that it has elected to sell. Once a patentee sells an item, it has secured that reward, and the patent laws provide no basis for restraining the use and enjoyment of the product. That might be a key sentence. I would call shutting down a game so that the person who bought it has no way to ever run it again, restraining the use and enjoyment of the product, wouldn't you? There might be something there. But this hasn't been tested in court, so most of this is in a legal gray zone. That means the law hasn't specifically said if something is legal or not, so everybody has to guess based on other laws. I'm obviously on the this is fraud side, because if the law says one thing and the outcome is the exact opposite, then something's breaking down. But how does this actually play out? Let's see. Do you own your game? Theoretically, yes. You technically never lose ownership of your perpetual license. It's yours. In practice, unclear. There's been no higher court ruling on whether games as a service infringes upon your perpetual license. This is what I'm trying to change. In real world terms, also known as the only part I actually care about, no. If no normal person can ever be expected to use their product again after the company disables it, that is certainly effective loss of ownership. Seller intent, no. Games as a service are designed to have their functionality removed at a later undisclosed date, and the data is encrypted to prevent you from restoring it yourself. It doesn't get any more deliberate to remove your ownership than that. Games as a service is a situation where the outcome is the exact opposite of the intent of the law. This is why the myth that you don't own your games keeps persisting. People are just saying what they're seeing with their own eyes. Laws are meaningless if they're not enforced. And that's all I have for US law. But fortunately, things are a little more optimistic in other countries. In Germany, there's a political party that initiated a study to try and reduce planned obsolescence using existing laws on the books. So kind of like what I'm doing. Some parts I found noteworthy. Introduction of minimum standards for repair. Obligations to provide repair instructions. In France, the Hammond Law was introduced in 2014 to more or less make planned obsolescence illegal. Except that it looks like that only applies to physical goods. So there may or may not be an opening there. And hey, it's being put to the test suing printer companies Epson, HP, Canon, and Brother for violating this law. Would be great if they could establish a precedent for software too. Boy, printers are the games industry of the real world, huh? And in Europe in general, the European Parliament accepted a resolution to lengthen consumer goods and software's longevity to combat planned obsolescence. And back to Australia, the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission has consumer guarantees including that your product is safe, lasting, and with no faults. Well, games as a service are safe, so you know, one out of three. 
Now it also says this doesn't apply if you knew of or were made aware of the faults before you bought the product. This is another gray area again. The company usually does tell you Games as a Service could cease working at any time in the end user license agreement. But is this really following the intent of the law? If the company is creating the defect in the product on purpose and does it over and over again to the point where selling intentionally defective products is their whole business model, that still smells like fraud to me and should at least be examined. Now, I don't know the details of these laws or movements since it's hard enough for me to research this as it is, let alone in different languages, and it looks like they're mostly focused on physical goods, but for God's sake, we've got to get software on board this train. Just requiring companies to provide repair instructions will be night and day compared to where we are now. The bottom line is it looks like a lot of people are getting upset over companies ripping customers off, and the law is playing catch up with what technology is doing. Games as a service are goods in these countries, which means there's a real chance they could be protected under the law. The intent of these laws is almost identical to my war on games as a service. Software has got to piggyback onto these laws and get examined by the right governing bodies. And that is it for legal arguments. Ah! I'm taking a break. You want to take a break? I'm taking a break. Okay, so those are the legal arguments. Yeah, that was fun. But I need to cover everything, so let's get conceptual. Maybe you're thinking, okay, so what if the law says games are goods? Maybe they're really services and the law is just outdated. Okay, let's pretend the law doesn't exist. We're writing it fresh. If that was the case, then games as a service would be unlike any other service that exists. I'm not joking. Every other service I can think of has at least one of the following conditions. One, an expectation of how long it lasts. If you pay an electric bill, it's usually for a month at a time. Or if you go to an amusement park, your ticket lasts the day or the season. The point being, everybody knows when the service is over and it ends or you have to renew it. Two, there's a general expectation of when it's done. If you pay roofers to fix your roof, you may have no idea how long that will take, but you know when it's fixed. There's a rough idea of when the service is finished. Three, there are real world limitations towards keeping the service going. Some services can go on forever. If I rent a plot of land, I don't have to do anything but collect my money each month pretty much. Hence number one here. In fact, I've had a landlord before where at one point I wasn't sure if he was alive or dead, but the service kept going. But most services require real resources to continue. If you go to a concert and you're having a good time and just want to stay, well that's great, but the band has to stop sometime. Eventually they're going to run out of coke. Maybe you can stump me, but I couldn't think of one service that didn't require at least one of those conditions, except games as a service. Hence, even on a conceptual level, they're not services. Here, I'll show you. Expectation of how long it lasts. Well, subscription games like World of Warcraft, yes, they win this round too, damn it. Subscription games really are services and they're not fraud. I'll have to get them on the final round. So besides those few games that still require a monthly fee to play, no, this doesn't apply. If there's an expectation for how long games as a service last, then what is it? The Calling 2 lasted a week and a half. Meridian 59 has been going on over 22 years. That's no help. Well, what do the games themselves tell you? Well, most don't tell you anything. They just say they can be shut down at any time for any reason. Some say they can be shut down at any time plus 30 days. Even then, I'd argue nobody buying the game is actually expecting it to stop working after 30 days. Now, I'd say there's no standard here, but that's not true. There is a standard for games. The traditional standard is forever. 
There are people who speedrun Super Mario Brothers. That game's over 30 years old. So yeah, forever, that's a good standard. Games as a Service is trying to push a new standard, except it doesn't have one, just that it's less for you. Oh, except for The Secret World and Fallout 76. They're both saying you'll be able to play them forever. Um, okay? Well, for every other game as a service that doesn't last forever, this is a concrete example of how your rights are being taken away from you. We've gone from play forever to whatever the seller feels like. So no, this does not apply. Expectation of when it's done. Yeah, let me ask you, when is somebody done with a game? When they beat it? What if they want to play it again? What if it's a game that has no ending? It's just sort of an ongoing thing. What if they want to come back and play it after a few years? Exactly, there's no standard at all here. Well, no, that's not right either. There is a standard for games. The old standard used to be that you own the game, so you decide when you're done with it. And that's going to be different for every person. So, no general standard. Yeah. Real world limitations. Okay, let me explain this one. Remember that body and brain analogy I made to the server and clients earlier? Well, the vast majority of video games throughout history have been sold with both the body and the brain. You got the whole package, so you can keep the game running as long as you want it. Now, with the server and client model, they're set up so that the brain here needs maintenance by real people and computer hardware and electricity bills and so on. But that's a choice, not a necessity. See, at their core, video games are code. They're numbers. They don't wear out over time. The number three works just as well now as it did thousands of years ago. It just looks a little different. The containers that hold the data can wear out, but they can also be copied from one container to the next. So there's an infinite supply. Don't worry, we're not going to run out of numbers. They're always on tap. Now the server is usually maintained like a service while it's running, but once it's shut down, it could just be copied over here and someone else could get it running. Companies almost never do that, but the point is the limitation isn't real. It's artificial. Somebody made it up. They could just as easily undo it. In fact, it's easier to undo this rather than set this split up in the first place. Again, most games don't even have this limitation. It's not a perfect analogy, but imagine a natural park. You may pay to go there as a service, and there will be people maintaining the roads and trails, running a visitor center, etc. And that takes real resources. But if the park runs out of money and shuts down, the park doesn't cease to exist. The trees are still there. The mountains and rocks are all still there. We don't erect an indestructible dome around the park that allows nothing in or out and can survive a direct missile strike and then tell everyone with a lifetime pass that they can never enter the park again. But that's almost exactly how Games as a Service works. This is not a good standard. I hope one of these analogies is sticking. Anyway, the point to all that is that even without the law telling us what's what, Games as a service are really not services. They're goods, so they should be treated as such. But hey, maybe you're saying they're a weird exception and should still be treated as services. Okay, why? I usually look at the law and rules from the perspective of what's the actual outcome. Well, the end outcome of most games as a service is that they're destroyed and can never be played again. Geez, that seems like a really high price to pay to treat them as services. Now you might be thinking, well, yeah, that sucks, but then we also get anti-cheat measures, stat tracking, matchmaking, easy updates, and da -da 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 -da. See, that's the narrative talking. We can still have all that stuff and not destroy the game. The narrative likes to frame it like you can't have the good without the bad. That's what's known as a false dichotomy, and it's just wrong. It's like how you can simultaneously be for the circus coming to town, but against clowns stabbing people. I know that sounds impossible to some people, but it's not that hard a concept. Companies don't have to give up anything while they're supporting the game. It's only once they shut the game down that they need to stop treating them like a service and give the customers their goods. Now you might be thinking, yeah, but that's probably a bunch of work, right? 
Well, it can be, but I'm not an expert. So I talked to someone who is. I asked that developer who worked on a server emulator, how much work would it take for companies to provide the bare minimum to give users a reasonable chance to create a server emulator once the game shuts down? Well, he said there were two basic options. I'm not even gonna go over these, but you can see them here. Now this would not be enough for a playable game. This would be more like those repair notes, like it was mentioned in those European planned obsolescence laws. But okay, this doesn't seem like too much work, so I asked him how long would it take the developers to do this? He said it depended on how well the game was written and how competent the developers are, but anywhere from less than an hour to a few days. Okay, so now let's compare. Here are the total pros and cons of having games as a service the way we do it now. Under pros, the developers save anywhere from less than an hour to a few days work. All right, that's a positive. And under cons, everyone who paid for the game along with anyone in the future interested in the game will never be able to run it again. Hmm. No, this doesn't seem like a good idea to me. In fact, this looks like a really bad deal for everyone. In order for this to be a good deal, I'd say we need a situation like the day after tomorrow, where these people are hiding in a library from the worst blizzard ever and need to burn some books so they stay warm and don't die. See, to me, that looks like a better trade-off for destroying media. I'm pretty sure games as a service doesn't save lives. Now, I understand if you think I'm framing this unfairly, because it sounds kind of crazy that this is the entire reason the industry is defrauding customers and destroying products with millions of dollars and thousands of hours of work behind them. But this is the only honest reason I've seen. It reminds me how in the 60s, auto manufacturers fought against seatbelts being mandatory because even though they saved lives, they did cost some money and automakers didn't want that. I won't lie. This does cost some money to do, but not much at all. I would guess well under 1% of the total budget. It's certainly cheaper than making a game a service to begin with. So even without the law, if this is the entire reason games are not preserved and customers can never use their products again, I don't find that particularly compelling. It's almost like if there are no laws on this, then there should be. And that brings me to the final argument, and this one I can even use on World of Warcraft. Finally. Now this may sound crazy considering the first half of this video, but I don't actually care about this topic because the industry is breaking the law. That's just a coincidence. I only cover that legal mess because there could be some real power behind that. I think the law is going to be the only way out of this, but that's not my main motivation here. No, I care because games as a service is destroying games. Quite successfully, too. Every once in a while, you'll hear people ask if games are art. I don't have an answer on that, but I think it's pretty clear games are creative experiences often worthy of preservation. So I'll say art just to keep it simple. I mean, come on, if you're looking at stuff like this and are saying, no, this has no artistic value at all, you're just being grumpy. You know David Bowie's in a game, right? Anyway, the point here is that games as a service is more than just a consumer rights issue. Even though the quality ratio is debatable, games contain ideas, art, often dialogue, and ways of interacting that aren't present in any other medium. They're more than just products. If I buy a toaster that's designed to fail, well, I still think that's wrong, but I can always buy another toaster and still have toast. Whereas games are unique experiences. You can't replace them any more than you can replace books in a library with different authors. You can't replace Dracula with Twilight and say nothing was lost because they're both about vampires. It doesn't work that way. I'm not gonna spend much time explaining why saving art has value because for me, it's innate. If you don't understand why art or creative works have value, I probably can't reach you on that. Maybe a philosopher can feel that one. For me, it's just an instinctive response. Now, of course, we can't save all artistic works. That's just not practical. There's too many, plus some of them suck. But we can decide for ourselves what's worth saving and what's not. Games as a service denies that chance to everyone. When I see a game with obvious creative value being destroyed, this is what comes to mind. Now, 
Now, the reality is both better and worse than that. The part that's better is that games that are destroyed are far less likely to contain ideas that are so powerful some see them as a threat. The part that's worse is that publishers are way more successful at destroying games than oppressors ever were at destroying books. Or, you know, at least within the past few thousand years. Even at book burning rallies, people didn't burn every existing copy of a book they hated. And yet, a lot of games as a service have a 100% death rate. There is no comparison to that in modern media. I guess in the early days of film, we lost a lot of stuff because the studios didn't know any better. That's what scares me. Now we do know better, and yet we're still going backwards. It's like watching a driver take a bus over a cliff, and he knows he's taking it over the cliff. It's a kind of madness. And speaking of modern media, you can rent movies or stream music as a service, but you can also buy them and keep them as goods. I guess some TV shows or radio shows you can't buy, but guess what? You can back them up yourself, legally. Not to dip back into the law again, but that's what this case was all about. Technically, it's already legal to back up games as a service in multiple countries, even in the USA. But if game companies make that impossible, then what does that matter? I care about reality, not fantasy rights. I want to say games as a service are the only form of modern media without real world limitations that you cannot preserve. It's kind of amazing in a terrible way. And that's what this all comes down to for me. Even if games as a service passed every legal test, which it hasn't, then the law would be wrong. Games as a service, the way we do it now, permanently destroys games and all the work the creators put into them. It's entirely preventable and serves almost no purpose for anyone. It's just wrong. The whole point of laws is to have a more civilized society. Wanton destruction of art that others are trying to preserve and have paid for is not civilized. That's why this needs to stop, even for subscription games. We just have to stop it. 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 And that's my case. So I would be almost done, but you know how the internet is. Somebody can make a good point, but then somebody else comes along, nitpicks something, and then says, debunked, all done. Uh-uh. I mean, that may still happen, but I want to wreck that before it even gets started. Now, if you're already on board with what I'm saying, you can skip straight to the end. Yeah, see, there you go. But games as a service is a plague of an idea, so I need to burn out every last inch of it I can. So I'm going into overtime to show just how weak the opposition is. I think it's so bad it's indefensible, but hey, judge for yourself. So here are my rebuttals to every major counter argument or concern I can think of before they happen. Here we go. Let's start with the big one. Games as a service is legal because you agree to the terms stated in the end user license agreement. Well, the simple answer is yes, those terms apply as long as they don't contradict anything the law says. If they say something that is not legal, then those documents mean nothing, nothing. That's why I spent half the video focusing on the law and almost didn't care what those documents said. If the law says they're wrong, that's all there is to it. It's not even a debate. The end user license agreements are irrelevant to this conversation. That's what that Lexmark Supreme Court case was showing. They simply don't determine the law. It's good to think of those agreements like club rules. So if you're at the Moose Lodge and the rules say you have to make an antler face before you can speak at the meetings, well, then those are the club rules. You don't actually lose your right to speak. But let's crush this argument a little further. Maybe you think the law is wrong and the customer assumed the risk of shutdown when they bought the game. Okay. Well then, when was it supposed to shut down? I don't think there's been one case in the history of Games as a Service where the company told the customer when the game was going to shut down upon release. That means the agreements are made in bad faith because the company is purposefully withholding information from the customer. Now personally, I think that's a weaker argument that doesn't get to the core issue, but it's still true. 
Game shutdowns are not a force of nature. They are entirely within the company's control. In order to defend the end user license agreement, you would have to say that companies are entitled to sell you a product, break that product after the point of sale, not tell customers when that's going to happen, even though it's in their control, and then prevent customers from repairing the product after it's broken. That is not good business. That is predatory. Good luck defending that. Okay, here's another big one. Buying a game entitles you to the client software. You are not entitled to the server software. Technically, yes, that is true. But that's not the whole story. Part of what I was trying to show in the legal portion is that there's a precedent, if not laws, that customers are entitled to a working product or a reasonable chance of repairing one. So no, the customer is not entitled to the server software. But since they are entitled to a working product, that usually means the server software also. Doesn't have to. The company could patch the game for it to run offline instead. In fact, I have a really easy test that sums up my whole stance on this. Step one, company sells the game. Step two, the company conducts business any way they want to. Step three, company support ends. And step four, the customer has a reasonable chance to run the game after shutdown. What the company does in step two here is a black box. I am in no way trying to dictate how they run their business there. I'm only concerned with step four here. Can the customer run the game? In games as a service, the answer is currently no. This is what it's all about right here. Notice it doesn't say release the server software. It says give the customers a chance to run their game that they paid for. How the company does that is up to them. In fact, if you get confused by anything I've said in this video and get lost somewhere, just look at that chart. This chart is all you really need to know. Simple, easy. I guess I should have put that at the beginning. Oops. What you're proposing would require businesses to support their games forever. That's unreasonable. No, they wouldn't. In fact, I'm in favor of companies ending support for a game any time they want. That's why an end of life plan is essential. If you're a company and you end support for your game, but then the customer still has a reasonable chance to play it after that, that's it, you're done. You don't have to support anything. What needs to stop is support being a requirement to play the game. That's what Games as a Service is. If Games as a Service have to be treated as goods, it will hurt creativity of developers and restrain them. Well, first, I'd like to point out the industry made games as goods for decades, and I didn't see a lot of shortage of creativity myself. <laughs> and again, we're talking up to a few extra days of work. I don't see how that would kill creativity unless the point of the game was for it to die. Well, wouldn't you know it, we've had a game just like that, The Flock. This was a multiplayer game that the developers actually wanted to die. After a fixed amount of player deaths, it was going to shut down forever, and they told people that right from the beginning. Now, I would actually allow an exemption for this game, because I think there's an argument to be made that this was performance art. See, all other games as a service, they don't die because the creators want them to. It happens because they become unprofitable and they handle the shutdowns irresponsibly. But this one, game death was the entire point. So guess what happened? They ran out of money to pay for server hosting, so they shut the game down prematurely. So the one game that wanted to die couldn't do it the way it intended. Its creative vision was compromised because of Games as a Service. Thus, as far as I know, Games as a Good has never hurt creativity. Let's look at that chart again. Does this chart look like it's strangling creativity? But let's say it somehow was. Is that one game being allowed to die not worth making rules for all others? I don't think so. If the law was enforced on games as a service, it would negatively affect a lot of companies that would have to go back and change their games, and they may not be able to do that. I consider the current situation so bad that I would accept that any laws in this not apply retroactively. If I can save all the games of the future for the price of 100 or so games today, that's a devil's bargain I can live with. Now, it's not like I have any power to compromise with. I'm just talking on a pure conceptual level. 
I want every base covered. This is such a black and white issue to me. I don't want to leave any room for people going, oh, it's so hard to come up with a rule for this. I guess it's impossible to do anything about it. No, I want clear rules for any scenario. In fact, if I miss one, come at me. I'll straighten you out. What about free or free to play games? Well, if a game is truly free, no money involved, I'd say the law doesn't apply, nor should it. That would hurt creativity. People will want to experiment with concepts and throw bad experiments out sometimes. There doesn't need to be a higher responsibility on the person if they're just messing around. It's once they start taking money for that that they're entering legal territory and just a higher responsibility in general, since then their actions start affecting others. Now, free-to-play games, games that are free, but you can also buy extra items or features, those are easy. Treat them like any other commercial game. If you buy a virtual sword in a game, and then the game shuts down so you can no longer access it, it's been taken from you. Your property rights have been infringed upon, hence the need to treat it like the good it is so you can keep what you paid for. Making a server emulator work on another system is a lot of work. Developers can't be expected to do that. Well, that's why I presented the minimum effort options here. See, the situation is so bad right now, I found a way to lower my standards even further. I used to think these were the only ways for a company to not commit fraud for a games as a service shutdown. But wouldn't you know it, that minimum effort solution sort of qualifies too. If a developer provides this, then the game enters possible to repair territory which I still don't think is great, but I can live with that. And again, this is anywhere from under an hour to a few days of work. If that is still just too much work for you to handle, then you shouldn't be selling games as a service. Laws enforcing games as goods would negatively affect games that get shut down temporarily, but then come back up. Good point, I agree with you. That's why I think a grace period is quite reasonable. If a game is shut down for a couple months but then comes right back up so buyers can play it again, that's acceptable. I think what the appropriate time period is is debatable. However, I consider never an unacceptable answer. Requiring companies to give players a chance to play their games upon shutdown is overreach and an infringement on business rights. The whole idea behind a perpetual software license is the business is giving up a tiny bit of its rights in exchange for money. It's the customer paying the business, not the other way around. What's actually happening is overreach from the business. They're trying to take back rights that they sold. If I were to sell you a car and then later steal it and drive it back to my lot, we wouldn't say I'm protecting my rights. We would say I robbed you. You're just being an idealist. Things break down or go bad all the time. Games are no different. Yes, they are. Video games are code, numbers. Games are more like stories. Books go bad, stories don't unless we let them. Hey, there's this story called The Odyssey. It's pretty good. It's about 3,000 years old, though it's only been published for 2,400 years. When's that one supposed to go bad by? But you know what? That's not a game. So how about Go? That one's two and a half thousand years old. People still play it. So no, this doesn't apply to games. See, I have to point this out because some people just don't get it. Cheese goes bad. Car tires go bad. Math equations do not. Again, there's a real narrative pushing back against this. Just to pick on someone, take a look at this article. Elliot here argues that all these online games are going to get shut down. He's right about that. Then he tries to argue that this is welcome and inevitable. Well, no, that's wrong. He then compares game shutdowns to TV shows ending, like Star Trek. I'm guessing if he took a logic class in school, he didn't get top marks. See, here's the difference, Elliot. People can still watch those TV shows today because they were preserved. If no one today could ever watch Star Trek again, then yes, that would be a solid analogy. What he's actually arguing here is development and support on a game eventually ends. Yes. That's why an end-of-life plan is necessary. Their shutdown is inevitable. Their destruction is not. There are people playing Star Wars Galaxies right now, even though that game was officially shut down over seven years ago. Do you think those people accepted the ending back in 2011? 
Now that's only possible because a developer illegally leaked code to the game, but it just goes to show a game ending is not inevitable at all. Now I don't think Elliot here is a bad faith actor, I think he just doesn't know any better. And it's unfortunate he's also a game journalist, because then he influences others to buy into the misinformation. This is exactly how a constructed narrative works. Go read the Odyssey, Elliot. Maybe something will click in your brain. What you are proposing is outrageous, because it would require companies to give up their intellectual property, and they cannot release their game without losing their trademark. Okay, I pointed out earlier that the perpetual license in no way entitles the buyers to the intellectual property rights. All they get is that single instance of it. I was never arguing that rights holders should lose their IP. That's actually the whole point. People with perpetual licenses have rights also. As for trademark, companies can still protect their trademark and release an unsupported game. They just have to be in front of it and define the terms. As an example, Grand Theft Auto, a commercial game, has been released for free multiple times by Rockstar, and they no longer support that game. Do you honestly think Rockstar lost the rights and trademark to the Grand Theft Auto franchise because of that? I think they have some money invested into that one. Using trademark as an excuse to kill a game means the company is operating irresponsibly. That's the point here. If the company wants to solve a problem, they can. If they don't, there's infinite excuses. Not good excuses, but excuses nonetheless. You say games are goods, but old arcades were services. So there is a historical precedent for this. See, I knew you were going to say that. Well, let's go back to that service list again. With arcades, you had one of these first two criteria. Maybe you played the game until you died, or played until three minutes were up. It depended on the game. And for sure, arcades had real limits. These were machines with space-age technology that weighed 300 pounds. And hey, if you really wanted to, you could buy the arcade machine as a good and preserve it. Oh sure, it costs thousands of dollars, but that goes back to the real-world limits. It's just not the same thing at all. In fact, arcade machines only prove the point. Arcades mostly died off, but the games survived. You keep mentioning the law and need for law enforcement, but this isn't necessary. Companies just need to be convinced preserving games is in their interest, and customers need to make conscientious buying decisions. Listen, we tried it your way already. It didn't work. For decades, this wasn't an issue for the vast majority of games. Nobody was enforcing laws on games as a service because almost nobody was doing it. Great! That's not what's happening now. We're seeing large percentages of blockbuster titles engaged in games as a service. Why should we try to convince companies not to do something when they're the ones that created the problem in the first place? The companies that can be convinced aren't the ones doing this. Remember, this absolute minimum effort solution could take under an hour. But even I have to admit that still takes some effort. Killing games requires no effort. I've heard people say before that companies would be happy to preserve games if they could just be convinced that it's more profitable. Well, you know those people running shell games on the street that are scams? They're asking you to pick a cup when the ball is actually in their pocket? I'm sure they would be happy to run an honest game if you could convince them that was more profitable than scamming people. But the thing about fraud is that it already has an excellent profit to work ratio. A maximum one even. Customers are not going to convince companies that honest business is more profitable than fraud because it's usually not. But I think law enforcement could convince them. But hey, prove me wrong. Maybe the industry will see the error of its ways and stop killing games before any of this ever goes to court. But do you really want to bet on the industry policing itself? Really? I'll bet against you. Hit me up, my email is at the end of this video. What about streaming only games? Streaming only games are ones you can only play through a video feed. It's the only way. So forget everything that was shown in that body and brain chart. Streaming only games is like you're watching all that through a window. You have nothing then. At this point in time, these are mostly prototypes, but they're coming. However, it's the same thing as before. If they're under a subscription license, then all I have is the preservation argument not to destroy history. I'm not sure there's any legal standing. But if they're under perpetual licenses and you buy the streaming games, yep, back to fraud. 
That's why we need to challenge this now before this becomes the norm. And that also means they'll have to release a lot more than this in order to let customers repair their game after shutdown. You are pushing to enforce laws on games as goods, but won't that lead to companies declaring everything as a service with a subscription fee and getting around it that way? That is a risk, but you know what? We've been there before and saw how it turned out. In the early to mid 2000s, almost every MMO game was subscription only. Well, guess what happened? Almost all of them either failed or went to a different payment model. Only a few survived on subscription fees. So if every company goes to a subscription model, most are going to fail because gamers aren't going to be eager to have five different game bills a month. I think the economics of this aren't going to work out for companies that do this exclusively, and they know it. That's why games as a service exist. They're pretending to be services while they're really goods and they're evading the responsibilities of both. What about delisted games? Delisted games are games you can't buy online anymore or sometimes at all. I have mixed feelings on those. On one hand, I of course want people to be able to play games that they're interested in. On the other hand, I don't think it's reasonable to force companies to sell their games if they don't want to. There's nothing fraudulent about what they're doing, so all I have is the preservation argument. And again, this comes back to me wanting to stay black and white on this issue. And I am laser focused on not killing games. Maybe once we solve that, I can care more about other areas like this. What about games that are updated all the time, so the early version is very different than the later version? Isn't it unreasonable for developers to preserve each version? That could take a lot more work, yes which is why I'm willing to compromise on this too. I would consider any working version of the game as adequate compensation for the buyer. Now, of course, it'd be nicer to have each version available, but again, I want to leave no excuses not to provide customers with a working copy of the game. So if the company can only provide 1.0 and not 3.6, whatever. Anything is better than nothing. We're getting way too much nothing right now. I don't care if old games aren't preserved because I only play new games. Fine, then you shouldn't care if laws get enforced on the old ones. Although sometimes they're not that old. Anyway, this shouldn't affect you. You can go back to sleep. This guy challenged EA in court on how his game should last longer and lost. Therefore, you don't have rights on your games. This case was arguing the multiplayer portion of his game should last longer, and it ended up being sent to arbitration, which is notorious for siding with businesses, and the records were kept private. He could have been arguing the case on completely different grounds than what I've been making that wouldn't hold up in court. We don't know what happened, and whatever did happen is not the law of the land. This is also a perfect example of why legal strategy matters. If you go into the wrong court with the wrong argument, you'll lose. I found a ruling in the UK that says perpetual licenses aren't perpetual, so you're wrong. First, this was only in the UK. Second, the perpetual part was more in reference to its usage in the contract, and the fact that it was referring to 10 years to begin with means it wasn't a perpetual contract in the first place. So that's just a really odd interpretation that may not apply specifically to software. Third, the European Union High Court ruling on perpetual licenses supersedes this one. Maybe Brexit will shake things up, but even then, it will still just be the UK. If companies release information about their servers, this means other games they're hosting with the same software could be hacked. I asked that developer about this, and he said in either of these scenarios, this doesn't give a hacker enough information to hack another game that he couldn't get without it anyway. But even if he's wrong, I kind of want to say too bad. At some point, a company should take responsibility for its actions. And that's how I feel about most of these counter-arguments. They're excuses. They're excuses not to do what everybody in gaming should know is needed. This right here is not the end of the world. Somehow, companies found a way to make thousands of games in the past and not destroy them. It's necessary to go back to that. And it's cheap. See, companies are going to fight us all the way on this because, you know, customers are the enemy. But this is what they care about. This is their gravy train. And preserving games doesn't need to interfere with that. If I could get companies to understand one thing, it's that this is going to be way cheaper than any litigation. 
I don't expect them to get that message, but I wanted to say it. All I want here is the absolute bare minimum of responsibility to not kill games. Just the tiniest bit, my god. And finally, we're done! So what now? Well, I didn't make this video for my health. This isn't some TED talk where I say something positive and then everybody acts like the problem's solved. No, I made this to actually get something done. At this point, I've taken things as far as I can on my own. So this video is an SOS for help to take things further. If you think you can help with ending this practice, let me know. Here's my email. I probably need people like lawyers or law students, especially in consumer law, activist organizers, or anyone with connections to organizations that could actually get the ball rolling on this. Here, I made cheat sheets of all the important stuff I discussed in the video. I'll make this and key information you might want available as a download link also. I think there might be some meat on some of the legal precedents, but we need them to be examined and ruled on. Here's a few more ideas I had about possible places to start. And the thing to realize is we don't need to win all battles to win the war. Say we can't make any progress at all in the United States, but we can in the European Union and Australia. Well, that could be enough to make companies add end-of-life plans globally, because then that will be cheaper than facing fines or lawsuits. Anyway, I don't know what to do with this information, who to contact, what the procedure is. I'm a layman. It's a miracle I was able to put this together as it is. My most valuable function in all this is as a mascot to get people fired up in the right direction. Yeah, like that. That could be me. Somebody else needs to figure out how to use this. Maybe an agency says they can help, but they need enough public interest first. Well, then I'll be right back up here telling everybody to contact them. Or maybe all that's needed is some legal person submitting the right documents to the right offices. I'm trying to pull people out of the ether who have more of a clue how to push this forward than I do. I said at the beginning that I'm declaring war on games as a service. That's true, but this is retaliatory. The games industry itself has declared a war on ownership against the consumer for years now. And they're winning. We're seeing the industry act with utter impunity on this. At the time of this video, a new era is starting. Stadia has been announced with streaming-only exclusive games, meaning you'll never be able to preserve those. It's impossible. Not even that 0.1% chance. And they're not alone. So many companies are tripping over themselves to do streaming games just like that. The games industry is so eager to take away the concept of consumer ownership. And that means these games are going to get destroyed. This is like something out of a science fiction story to me. And yet, here we are. Now, I'm as cynical a person as you're going to find on this topic, and even I am seeing a chance to change this. The law could be our ally on this. We don't know. The problem is the law has been utterly asleep at the wheel regarding the games industry. So we have to wake the law up. We're going to lose for sure if it keeps on sleeping. Even if it's against us, there is no downside to getting the law involved. The situation has gotten that bad. Because of that, I'm only interested in plans where the end game is some sort of legal process. I think that's our only chance. I don't think changing consumer habits will work. In fact, I saw a quote before that said something like, Anytime someone says the solution to a problem is to vote with your wallet, I know that cause is doomed. That really reflects my own views as well. I think legislation could work, but I also see that as almost impossible. I have no power. If I was a multimillionaire and could hire lobbyists to push this through Congress, yeah, that could work, but that's not me. But getting judges somewhere to interpret existing laws? That at least seems possible. I care about games not being killed, but I'm not going to fight this forever. There are other things I'd rather be doing. But I either need this practice to stop, or else I need to be defeated. I need to have high courts come down and say games will never be protected before I can give this up. This is just phase one, informing people and the SOS for help. Phase two is to wake the law up. We need knowledgeable people for that part. Now, if you want to help but don't have any particular knowledge on this, well, then you're in the same boat I am. We're just going to have to wait and see who reaches out. Believe me, I'll let you know if we need your help.
In the meantime, the only advice I have is making noise on this certainly won't hurt. Just getting gamers to understand that they legally do own their games isn't a bad start. I'm still impressed by that post explaining it. And you're welcome to use my chart. It's nice and simple. In fact, you can take anything I've said in this video and use it however you want. That's fine. Maybe more noise will help. Maybe it won't matter. That's large scale zeitgeist manipulating stuff. I don't know how to do that. I'm single issue here. Stop killing games. Stop it. 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 Jeff, stop it. Stop it. Stop it. This needs to stop.